Hi, these are edited versions of the lectures that I taught synchronously over Zoom. I hope you find them useful. This is lecture 12. Today we're going to talk about binary choice uh, or binary choice models. And um, in terms of how this fit, um, you know, as I said in this second part, which I call topics, uh, the lectures are um, marginally related, but there is some connection between what we're doing. And then if you remember last class, we talked about regression trees and random forests, but one particular thing we discussed briefly was um, classification trees, which again was trying to predict y when y was binary given a set of uh, covariate x's. So today is going to be related to classification trees, despite the fact that we're going to take a, a different approach. Um, at the end of the day, we will not care about prediction all the time. Uh, we're going to specifically talk about the so-called uh, latent index models or linear index models. And we're going to divide the lecture in identification. We're just going to talk about what identifies this particular model when we impose parametric and semi-parametric assumptions. And then uh, we're going to talk about estimation in the parametric case. And we're going to talk about the two popular ways to do this, which are the logit and probit models. Um, and that's about it. So towards the end, just going to be, I'm going to say, very standard. Um, the, the first part just probably going to deviate to the standard treatment that you're going to find of this topic in, in most uh, books. Uh, but I think is um, the way at least that I think about these problems that I want to um, extend to you. So the setup is that today we're going to consider the problem of estimating the probability that y equals 1 condition on x, where y is binary. So that means that takes values in 0 and 1. There are two problems that, despite being um, mathematically sometimes equivalent, uh, interpretation matters. And so sometimes we'll care about predicting y given x, and it's just we care about this function over here, and that's it. Just give me an x and tell me what's what are the odds that y is 1. And that's a prediction problem. And that's very related to the classification trees that we dis discussed last time, and for that matter, any method that can just give you a prediction of y given x could, you know, think about doing uh, this non-parametrically. We could use the tools that we learned about another Watson and local linear and so on. However, um, sometimes we will want to view this probability as a model that has some structure. It comes from a structural model. And then in that case, we may want to care about partial effects, causal effects, and so on. This is uh, traditionally the approach that is taken uh, often in I.O. So I'm going to say that, you know, at the sake of being perhaps uh, too general, trying to group these views, that, you know, in, in sometimes, you know, labor fields, whatever, where you need propensity scores. Um, but, you know, propensity scores are used to um, determine, estimate, or identify causal parameters, like in propensity weighting that we saw last time. Uh, then you just need the propensity score to estimate an average treatment effect or something like that. It's an input to get the causal parameter you care about. And in that case, you just want a propensity score. It's a pure prediction problem. You don't care about other features of, of it. Whereas in I.O., uh, perhaps this is a choice of a consumer deciding whether to purchase something or not. And in that case, you care about modeling the behavior and you care about thinking about counterfactuals okay, and other stuff. So in that case, it's more about a model. So moving forward, when you use these tools, I think as a first step, it's important to understand which of these two worlds you are. If you're like trying to understand behavior and and you're viewing this really as a model, or if you're just this is an input of something else that you're doing and you just care about the prediction. So today we're going to consider parametric and semi-parametric models. Both are going to be based on the so-called linear index, where if we have y, x, and u, as uh, random variables to connect with notation that we used before. Here, y will take values in 0, 1. u is just a scalar. And x is a set of covariates of dimension k plus 1, where the first one is a constant term. And then uh, a linear index model is one where the probability of y given x 
is equal to the probability of one y uh, one given x prime beta. So condition on x is the same as condition in on a linear combination of the x's that is given by you know the usual x prime beta business. And this part over here is what we call the linear index. Okay. Of course, this reduces the dimension of the problem, sometimes called dimensional reduction. So, um, the linear index structure is going to look like this. It's just, you know, given the objects that we defined before, y is going to be equal to 1 if x prime beta minus u is greater than or equal to 0. And as I wrote here, this is a threshold, threshold crossing model because, you know, you have this index here that crosses 0 or not. Single index model or linear index model. Y often indicates the utility maximizing decision maker observable choice between two alternatives. And then you're going to see these. And sometimes when you look at this model like this, um, you don't see it. So obviously, but um, let me write it as follows. Suppose that if you choose A, say there are two options, A and B. Okay, you choose A, your utility, utility is X prime. A beta plus U A, okay? And if you choose B, your utility is X prime B beta plus U B. Okay, and so this means that when do you choose B? You say you choose B, if x prime beta b plus u b, so the utility that you actually choose b is greater than or equal than the utility you obtain from choosing a, which is x prime a beta plus u a. And then if you just group these things um, on the other side, Actually, I did something that I didn't want to do, although you can do this. I don't want to do this. Okay, so apologies. We need to erase this. I'm going to let the x's be the same. I want to consider different um, betas. You don't have to, it's just that for simplicity now, this is conveys the argument that I want to give. So then if you take this to the other side, you have beta B minus beta A plus U B minus U A greater than or equal to zero. And so this is here where we're calling beta, and this is here where we're calling U. And essentially, you have the model that we have above, where you choose one, which is B in this case, when this guy is greater than or equal to zero. So oftentimes, people will say, we normalize the utility of one of the options to zero. And then the model that you have is essentially the difference between choosing one versus choosing zero, which is coming from this derivation that I did over here. So oftentimes people will talk about utilities or different utilities, okay, between two choices or normalizing one of the choices to zero. And sometimes you're just going to see that the model is written like this, where you actually are explicit about the two choices. Today, we're going to start by discussing identification of this model, okay? And by that, I mean, you know, we're going to define what are the objects that are unknown, which for now you can see includes beta for sure. But also, we haven't said anything about u and the distribution of u or the distribution of x. So we'll see what that is. And we're going to discuss identification. We're going to start in the uh, parametric model, which is the standard. Um, and then we're going to move to a more sophisticated case, which is the semi-parametric model. So what is the definition of identification? We discussed this when we uh, talk about the linear model. 
but in the linear model, identification is really straightforward, and it only depends on the expected value of x, x prime inverse, you know, existing, or or expected value of x, x prime being full rank, if you want. And in models that are nonlinear, identification tends to be trickier. Okay, so let's go over this. P is going to be the distribution of the observed data. Okay, in our case, it's going to be y and x, and we're going to denote by bold P the model for p and this is just gonna be indexed by a parameter theta theta here i'm gonna define in a second this is sort of like a general notation the important element is that theta here is allowed to have infinite dimensional components it's not just you know beta or something like that it could have for example the distribution of u conditional on x which is an infinite dimensional object the model is correctly specified if the distribution of the data that we observe belongs to the model that we pose and um, sometimes, you know, given that theta, as I said, is going to include a lot of things, conditional distributions and so on, uh, most often we will not care about uh, identifying theta entirely, but a function of theta uh, is going to be enough, which here I'm going to denote by lambda theta. So, for example, if theta includes beta and some distributions, you may only care about beta and not about these other distributions. So the definition of identification says, let capital theta not P be the collection of theta such that P is equal to P theta. That is, you know, you can write like this, all the theta such that our model is equivalent to the distribution of the data that we get to observe. And so we say that theta is identified if this set is a singleton for all P, okay? There's a unique value of theta that for a given P solves this situation where uh, your model equals the distribution of the data you observe. Um, and note that this is important in some cases. It could be that sometimes theta is not really um, identified, but a feature of it, which we're calling here lambda theta, could be identified. So sometimes identifying everything in a model is complicated, but you know, identifying certain features that you care about is um, a lot easier to do. And that often happens. So that's the definition of identification. So let's think about this then in the context of the parametric binary choice model. In the binary choice model, you know, the parameter theta is this guy over here. It includes three components, beta, the distribution of x, and the distribution of u conditional on x. All these three completely determine this object that we care about, which is the probability of y1, you know, given x in this model. So capital theta is the set of all possible values of theta. So notice how like here we have a mix of finite dimensional and infinite dimensional parameter. The claim here is that identification almost, and we're gonna see by almost mean, follows from the following assumption that says, you know, um, that states two conditions. P1 says that the probability of u condition on x is known, and in this case, we're gonna assume that it is normal so, uh, with mean zero and variance sigma square. So this is a parametric model where we make a parametric assumption about the distribution of u condition on x. And the second assumption says that there exists no set A in Rk plus one, such that A has probability one under P of X and A is a proper linear subspace of RK plus one. This is the general version of saying the expected value of X, X prime has rank one. It plays exactly the same role that in the linear model, we assume that there was no perfect collinearity. Well, this is um, essentially what we mean in the more, um, in the general case. So, given the assumption p1 okay where we see here that um one of the elements of theta is the distribution of u given x but we just said that this is a normal zero sigma square so essentially we're saying that the distribution of pu u given x is the part that is unknown is just sigma square so i'm going to use this here and I'm gonna say that from now on, theta is beta, p of x, and sigma, which is the 
unknown part of the distribution of u conditional on x. The proof approach is going to be as follows. A lot of these proofs are conducted by contradiction. You're going to assume that there are two values of theta. We're going to call one theta and the other one theta star, such that theta and theta star are different, and yet these two probabilities are the same, or the two models lead to the same observables, the same p. And if this happens, it has to be the case that we reach a contradiction, okay? Because we're saying that this gives identification. So we're going to do that. We're going to see along the way what we need, and then we're going to understand why here I wrote almost. So, um, proof. The distribution of x is identified from the di joint distribution of y and x. You observe x. So, of course, you identify the distribution of x. So, that is, the distribution of x is never a problem. In all the proofs that we have, px has to be equal to p star x. Whatever you change, if it's going to be equal to p, it has to have the same distribution of x because you identify that. So, p1, which is the assumption that says that u is normal, implies that the probability under our model of y being one condition on x is just the CDF of a normal applied to the linear index x prime beta divided by sigma, okay? That's what you obtain by just um, computing uh, this probability from the model. So if you don't see it or if you never did this, uh, you can write, notice that this probability is a probability under the model that um, u is less than or equal than x prime beta, which is the same as u divided by sigma less than or equal than x prime beta sigma. And u divided by sigma is standard normal, right? So we get this thing. So that's the argument to get that. Now, when you do the same, with the other parameter theta star, well, you obtain exactly the same, except that now you have beta star and sigma star. Know that we're making this proof by contradiction, so p theta and p theta star are the same by assumption, so it has to be that this ratio over here is the same. However, from this, we cannot conclude that beta is equal to beta star and that sigma is equal to sigma star. There's a scale problem, okay? Could be that these are different, but the ratios are the same. Could be that this is, you know, four and this is two, and this is two and this is one, and the ratio is going to be the same. So our analysis shows that any theta and theta star for which this ratio stays constant holds. And so, you know, we did not reach a contradiction. Okay. What we learn, however, is that we cannot identify theta, which is this object, but we can identify lambda of theta, which is this ratio over here, or this functional of theta, which includes p of x and the ratio of beta divided by sigma. That is identified, okay? What is not identified is beta and sigma separately. I'm gonna write here, beta and sigma are not separately identified. So what do we do about this? Well, typically people just go for so-called normalization, which is a way to say, I cannot get what I want, so I'm gonna do something about it. So what are you gonna do? Well, you can assume that the norm of beta is one. You can assume that the slope of beta is one, which is another way of normalizing things, or you can assume that sigma is one. Like with any of this, you know, 
enough to uh, identify beta and sigma separately. The last one is obvious because we're just saying sigma is equal to one. So of course, if sigma is equal to one, we can identify beta separately. So actually the model with sigma equal to one is called a probit. And when that's the case, theta is just this because sigma is one and the model is identified. To see this, just again, we can use condition P1, which is the one that now says that distribution of U conditional on X is standard normal. And then when you compute the probability of Y equals one condition on X under the distribution with parameter theta, that's uh, the CDF of a normal um, at X prime beta at the linear index. And then, you know, we said these two are the same. Let's assume that. So this has to be the same as the same CDF at beta star, which is the probability that Y equals one condition on X according to theta star. So, but, you know, if beta and beta star are different, okay, you need this condition to hold. You need that the probability of x prime beta and x prime beta star is equal to one, you need these two things to be exactly the same. But then this is a problem because notice that assumption A2 says that the probability that x, you know, belongs to a linear subspace or, or a subspace of RK plus one is not one. Okay, and so this is the probability that x, sorry, that x prime beta minus beta star is equal to zero. And this is the probability that x prime beta equals <coughs> x prime beta star. So assumption P2 gives us that this cannot happen. And so the parametric model is identified. So the probit model, where you assume the sigma is one, is identified by these two assumptions. The assumption that the U condition on X is just normal zero one, and by this condition that gives us that X is not linearly um, dependent. And so there's another model that gives you the same conditions called the logit which is another assumption on the distribution of U conditional on X says essentially that it is logistic. And you can replace P1 with this. You essentially go through the same proof. And so the first starting point of today's class is to say, if you have a parametric model where you make a parametric assumption on the distribution of U conditional on X and you impose uh, normalization. In this case, we went for this one, but we could have used some other normalization. By far, this is the most popular one um, used in class, in class, in in practice. Sorry. And so, if we do that, then uh, you identify the parameters that you want about, uh, do you care about, in particular beta. The question is whether theta is identified without parametric assumptions on this distribution. Is that something that we're going to discuss next? Are there questions about this? All right, so as I said, I want to now think about identification without assuming uh, parametric assumptions. And the, the first initial point would be, okay, in regression, we'll typically assume something like a zero conditional mean of the unobservables, okay? Which we did and use um, extensively. So that's the first idea I wrote here, mimic the linear model. Um, so, but it turns out that if you replace P1, which is the parametric assumption one, where like we say U is normal, with just um, mean independence, this does not work. And it was actually shown by Chuck um, that nothing is learned about beta and the probability of U given X when you just assume that the conditional expectation of U given X is not even useful to identify beta itself, okay? If you just care a feature of theta, as I said, um, then, 
the lesson there, which um, you get if you follow the arguments in the paper, you'll learn that mean independence assumptions in general are rather useless in nonlinear models. Okay. Not all the time, but you know, most often they don't have enough. They don't impose enough restrictions on the DGP for you to identify your parameters. So we can do this. We can mimic what we do in the linear model. So what can we do instead? Well, an alternative condition to assuming that the mean of U condition on X is zero would be to assume that the median of U condition on X is zero. And this is called median independence. And what you can show then is that if you assume median independence, then beta, which is a feature of theta, right, is identify under reasonable conditions. Well, which is this and something else. Okay. So, quote unquote, median independence is enough to identify a linear index model if, um, you know, semi parametric uh, case without assuming any uh, actual distribution for U condition on X. So the assumptions for the semi-parametric case, which I'm gonna list from S1 to S4, are the following. The first one is that the median of U condition on X is zero. The second one is exactly the same one we had before that we call P2, which is, you know, essentially there's not a proper linear subspace where X lies with probability one. And then the third one, notice it's just gonna be a normalization, which makes sense if in the parametric model, you need a normalization for beta, then, you know, if now you were assuming less than a parametric model, it's not surprising that we also need a normalization for beta. So one, two, three, I'm gonna say, are the same as in the parametric model, except that S1 is weaker. And now we need a, a new condition, which is S4. And S4 says um, the following. Px, so the distribution of x, is such that at least one component of the axis that you have has support equal to the real line, conditional on the other components with probability one. Moreover, the corresponding beta that is multiplying that particular x is non-zero. So this now put, puts a lot of you know, requirements on the axis that you observe, and in particular, you need one that is quote unquote, very continuous. That's what we need. We need this regressor to take values in the entire real line that we can move it around and regardless of conditioning on all the other axes. So suppose that the other axes are actually discrete. You have gender, age, uh, you know, well, conditional on all those things. You need to have this regressor that moves around. Okay. And that's going to play a key role for identification. So you can say then, and this happens again, this is sort of like a general thing. If you make weaker assumptions on the things that you don't observe, which in this case is you, typically that will force you to make more assumptions on the things that you get to observe. Okay. And so, which in this case is already excess. And as you make more assumptions on the things that you do not get to observe, which in this case is you, then you can quickly impose weaker conditions on the things that you do get to observe, which are the X's. Um, again, reviewing these conditions, S1 is weaker than P1 because its median independence is stronger, is weaker, sorry, than independence, which we had in P1 with sigma equal to one. S2 is the same as P2, exactly the same assumption. S3 is a normalization similar to sigma one in the probic case. And as I said, we need a normalization in the parametric case. Not surprisingly, we need a normalization in the semi-parametric case. And S4 is new and stronger, okay? And as I said earlier, it, it involves um, a stronger condition of what we observe, okay? So anyway, I just want you to keep in mind this idea that I mentioned earlier, that it is usually the case that when you want to identify something, you at some point you have to make some assumptions on things that you don't observe and things that you observe or things that you observe. And then the funny thing is that people or researchers oftentimes feel more comfortable assuming uh, strong assumptions on the things that they do not get to observe, okay? Because at the end of the day, you can discuss them.
Whereas S4 is not something that you have you can discuss. For example, if you have an application and your three regressors are all discrete, then you know that this doesn't apply, right? So, and you cannot defend that. So you can just not go and say, look, um, I satisfy this condition. This condition sometimes is gonna be uh, straight out violated. So instead of assuming something strong about something that you can actually refute and say so this doesn't hold, you prefer to make an assumption about something that you cannot refute, okay? Which is U is normal, okay? So you should think about this trade-off as you move forward. So let's look at the argument. The proof here is just gonna be simple, okay? Of how the model is identified. Um, mathematically, it's just really straightforward, okay? So that's why I decided in the end not to write it. Um, I just wrote the equations here, but I want you to understand conceptually how it works. And the proof is just gonna follow from this lemma, okay? And the lemma says the following. Let theta, which is beta, p of x, and p of u of x, satisfy S1, satisfying S1 be given, okay? Which is this condition, the median of u given x is zero. Then consider any beta star and says if, this probability over here is positive, then there's no other theta star satisfying S1 and also having P theta equals to P theta star. So this is gonna be the main ingredient because to prove identification at the end of the day, the only condition that we will have to check is this. And this says something simple, which is the probability that X beta star is negative and x beta is positive, or the other way, that x beta is negative and x beta star is positive, is positive. Zero is gonna be an important point. And why is zero an important point? Because zero is the median of u, okay? And so we're gonna be saying, if there is crossing, okay? Like we have a linear index above zero and a linear index below zero, regardless of which one it is. That's why there's a union here, okay? If that happens with positive probability, then we're gonna have identification. So how do you prove this? As I said earlier, most of these arguments are gonna be done by contradiction. So we're gonna assume that this there is such a theta, okay? That four holds and we have a theta star that you know gives us the same probability. And look where that goes. So suppose that we have a theta star that is different and gives us the same probability, okay? Then the probability that y is one condition on x being greater than a half happens if and only if this probability over here is greater than a half. That's our model, okay? I'm not doing anything in this step. It's just rewriting what it is. And this happens if and only if x beta is equal to zero. Think about the case where u is continuous, okay? Because that's simple. Then the median says that the probability of u being equal to zero condition on x is a half, okay? And so here we're saying, well, if this probability is greater than a half, it has to be that the number that you're considering here is larger than zero. And this is what this says. You do the same with theta star below, exactly the same arguments. When theta is theta star, then you know the probability of y is greater than half has to be uh, the same by our model than the probability that x beta star is greater than u. And this is gonna be greater than half if the index is greater than zero. So these are what matters is that the if and only if statements. And with this, we exploit this now to reach a contradiction as follows. We have that this condition here is positive. Our condition implies that, you know, there are two events here, either this event or this event, okay? which implies that either this happens here, this one is above zero, so this probability is above a half, this one is below zero, so this probability is strictly less than a half, 
or this happens where now this probability is above a half. And so this is because this is above zero and this is strictly below zero. So this probability is less than a half. Okay. However, again, this contradicts the fact that P theta is equal to P theta star and completes the proof. So essentially what we learn is that this condition is all we need to check if we want to study identification in this model. And that's what we're going to do next in the next theorem. Okay. By exploiting the result in this lemma. Any questions about this lemma before we move to the theorem? Let's keep going. So we're going to now prove this theorem. Under assumption S1 and S4, the semi-parametric assumptions, beta is identified. And the proof, we're going to assume with all loss of generality that the X that we have in this assumption S4 that has that there's a special regressor is just going to be the kth component. So it's going to be, whoops xk is going to be this special regressor, okay? That is continuous condition on all the other. And then the same assumption said that the beta for that regressor was different than zero, or just without loss of generality, we're going to assume that that beta is positive. You can just do exactly the same proof assuming that beta is negative. So that's going to be the first thing we're going to take. Then we're going to consider theta satisfying as one and as four. And then we're going to consider another beta. We're going to call a beta star that is different than beta. What we wish to show, and there's no, no theta star satisfying S1 and S4, such that these two lead to exactly the same probability. Okay, and from the previous lemma that we just showed, all we need to do, suffice it to check, is this condition from the lemma. If we can prove this condition for the lemma, okay, then we're done. And so, once we realize that all we have to do is to check this condition, then we're going to divide the proof into three cases. First case, just going to be beta star k is just negative uh, or positive. Yeah, negative. Second case, it's just going to be beta star k is zero. And third case, or, or the second case is going to be this is positive. And the third case, which is slightly different, is the case where beta k is zero. Those are the three cases that we have to check. Um, you know, the beta k is positive, so that one we don't need to bother. But this new beta that we're coming with, like we're trying to explore as an alternative solution to the model or alternative parameter that delivers the same observable distribution, um, we need to split it into the cases of, you know, what the sign of this beta star k is. The other betas are not going to play a major role, as you're going to see. So the proof is just going to go one, two, three, and check whether in each of these situations, this condition over here holds. Okay, that's it. And as I said, from a mathematic point of view, it's just going to be straightforward. Just adding and subtracting, nothing else. Okay. So consider first the case where beta star k is negative. Then you have that this probability over here can be written like this. Okay. I'm going to do this once because we're going to do it all the time. The idea is that we're going to partition X prime uh, beta star as, you know, let's call it X prime negative K beta star negative K plus X prime K beta K star. Okay. So we're going to partition X prime beta, the linear index into all the X's that are not K and the special x that is equal to k. And we're going to do the same for the other guy here. And I have the x prime beta is x prime beta negative k. Sorry. x prime negative k beta negative k plus xk beta k. Once you do this partition, okay, and then you can write these two statements, this one and this one, like this. This is the probability that xk is greater than 
the index of the other axis divided by beta star k. Notice how I flipped the sign because we're assuming in this case that beta star k is negative. And then xk is greater than or equal than this, where remember that we assume, well, we said, not assume, we said that without loss of generality, beta k was positive. Okay? So in the first case, we assume this. So notice then, this probability is positive by the assumption S4 that says the distribution of this variable conditional on all the other ones, you know, is supported on the real line. So the probability that X is greater than this number or this one, whichever is smaller, okay, or larger, actually, um, it's just going to be positive. And that's it. Case one follows immediately from S4. Okay, now suppose that um, beta star case is zero. Well, you do the same. You write this probability or this one, which are the, the ones that appear in the statement of the conditions that, that we need to check, okay? And then you do this partition that I did here at the top, except that now the beta star k disappears, okay? So then you have um, this here, and this over here, this here, and this over here. Notice that this doesn't depend on xk. The first part doesn't depend on xk at all. Okay, so I'm going to write it here. Here, no xk involved. I'm going to write here, no xk involved. Whereas the second part of the statement of the probability does depend on xk, okay? So then you have two cases. If this index here is negative, which means you are in this case, then, um, whoa, what is, uh, sorry. Uh, this should be, this is a typo. This is five. Then, five is positive by S4 because this is positive probability and this is positive probability by the assumption that this XK has support on the real line condition on the other axis. So if this happens, this part is positive. Whereas if you have the other situation, which is this index is greater than or equal to zero, then that means that you're in this case. And so if you're in this case, again, the assumption S4 tells you that the other part has positive probability Either you're here or you're here. If you're in either of those two, the probability is positive. And so you have that for the second case, which is beta star k is zero. We have that the probability of the event that we want is positive two. So case one, the probability is positive. Case two, the probability is positive. Both essentially use just this S24 assumption. So we're left with the last term. And the last term is beta star k is positive, okay? And if that's the case, okay, then you rewrite this, and then you see that this is equal to this probability. xk is in between this lower bound and upper bound in this case, or in the other case, is between this lower bound and upper bound, okay? So I'm going to say this is sort of like a lower bound, And then you have an upper bound. So we know that this X has distribution on the real line. So as long as this is an interval, we know that these probabilities are positive. So this is great, except that the only problem would be if the lower bound and the upper bound are the same with probability one. Because in that case, this probability would be zero because we have strict inequality and, and, inequality and inequality here. And this is also continuously distributed. So um, this is a problem. If the upper bound and the lower bound, which are these objects, are exactly the same, but probability one, we're in trouble. However, we have the other assumptions here that kick in to tell us that this cannot happen. First, assumption S3, okay? says that the norm of beta is one, okay? 
And so since we assume that beta and beta star were not the same, it has to be that this ratio is not the same, okay? So this follows from the assumption that the norm of beta and the norm of beta star are one because they satisfy the assumptions. If the norm is one for both and beta is different than beta star, then it has to be that this ratio over here is different. So that's the first observation. And so now, if you go to um, S3, which is the assumption that says that, you know, X doesn't belong to a subspace, then this probability here cannot be one by S3, which is what we have, okay? And again, if we now add S4, which it says this takes values on the real line, either this is greater than zero or this is greater than zero. And this concludes the proof. Questions? We can now move then to the parametric case and start thinking about estimation. Okay, so by now, if you follow what I said, we identify the model in the parametric case and the semi-parametric case. We're not gonna be talking about semi-parametric estimation, which is possible, and there are uh, people that worked on that, including, again, Chuck, okay? But uh, we're gonna talk about estimation in the parametric case. And so the previous theorem identifies beta only, so it's not enough for marginal effect. And here, this sentence is really confusing. Uh, previous theorem here means the semi-parametric theorem. That is, you can estimate beta semi-parametrically, and we'll learn that. But if you want to talk about like marginal effects and, and all this, you will need something about the distribution of U condition on X. We're gonna see here now. And the semi-parametric model does not identify the distribution of U condition on X. It just imposes that this mean median independent and identifies beta. And if the goal is only prediction, if you just wanna predict whether somebody, I don't know, is gonna be sick, by condition given X is gonna be a risk, uh, condition on given X is, and so on, then that's totally fine. You don't need more than that. But if if you want to go beyond the prediction and you want to start more thinking about how the X is affect Y and so on, you will need the distribution of U condition on X. Part of the reason why, you know, in practice, people have rely on uh, the parametric case. Okay, so we're gonna go back to that. And in the parametric case, the probability of Y even it being equal to one condition on X is equal to some function of the linear index. And the function is just gonna be whatever distribution you assume of U condition on X, okay? So it's gonna be the CDF of the normal, standard normal in the case of the probit, and it's gonna be this logistic, logistic function in the case of the logit, okay? So I'm gonna write F so I can cover both logit and probit simultaneously but depending on the setting, one is gonna be this or this. Uh, as you can see, these are known functions that do not depend on unknown parameters that are like fully known. The data is gonna be a random sample of size n from the distribution of y and x. So we're gonna denote it as usual. And um, since the model is parametric, we can estimate the model by maximum likelihood. And I know that you um, successfully passed and completed 480-2, so you're maximum likelihood experts now. So, um, you know everything that I wanna say now. First, you write the probability mass function of Y. <coughs> Sorry. First, you write the probability mass function of Y as follows. F beta of Y given X is just the probability of Y equals one to the power of Y. One minus the probability of Y equals one to the power of one minus Y. And you can write the log likelihood like this, okay? And this is the function that you typically are gonna be optimizing. If you can show that the beta that solves this is unique, okay, under the assumptions that we have, and then beta hat is gonna be the MLE um, of beta, okay? But the usual MLE results, now I'm not gonna prove anything because this follows from stuff you know. The square root n beta hat minus beta, conversion distribution to a normal with mean zero and variance b, where b is the inverse of the Fisher information. 
where sufficient information is just the negative of the expected value of the second derivative of the log likelihood, okay? Which is this object over here. Now, it turns out that this particular function uh, sometimes takes uh, simpler, simpler expressions, okay? And in particular, notice that we know that this is also equal to the expected value of the square of the first derivative. And the first derivative of the log likelihood in these models take a rather simple form. It's just y minus f divided by f times one minus f is like the usual p times one minus p uh, for binary variables times the derivative of this function, okay, uh, times x. So if you just plug that in into the expression and then you work out the algebra, you find that the actual expression that people will use in these models look like this, okay? And it involves in the denominator, the f times one minus f feature that I described before, and then in the numerator, the derivative of this f um, square, okay? And then we have the usual x, x prime. Notice that, um, the, um, the F is known. So, you know, given an estimator of beta, you can compute this, 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 and of course this. Very easy to obtain a plug-in estimator of this, um, asymptotic variance, okay? And so, and that's, that's what I want you to have in mind. So how do you interpret beta? So... For the moment, we're gonna consider x, j being continuously distributed. We're gonna talk about the discrete case in a second, but stick to me now and, and let's focus on this case. The, the linear case where the expected value of u uh, given x um, was zero, we had that the derivative of the conditional expectation of y given x given, or given x was beta j. So, you know, people will just um, then assume that in the case you had like some structural model and you wanted to give uh, interpretations of partial derivatives, or even if you wanted to go beyond and then start thinking about causality, uh, the betas were giving you the partial effects that you were looking for. However, in binary models, um, that is not necessarily the case because if you compute the derivative of the expected value of y given x, uh, with respect to xj, well, that's the derivative of the probability of y equals one given x with respect to xj, and then in our model is the derivative of f uh, with respect to xj times beta j. And as you can see here, we have beta j, of course, but then we have this other term that enters the marginal effect. So in the probit case, the derivative of the CDF of the normal is the PDF of the normal, and just this partial effect takes this form. And in the logic case, you can show that the derivative of f times one minus f is, uh, sorry, the derivative of f is a prime, it's just f times one minus f. So when you just plug it in here, you have this term pre-multiplying beta j. So in both cases, beta j, of course, uh, shows up as here and it's here. But as opposed to the linear model where beta j is all that matters to get a partial effect, in this binary choice models, you have an extra term that enters there. Importantly, these marginal effects will depend on the values of x, okay? So when you want the derivative of expected value of y condition on x, well, that derivative will depend on the x that you evaluate that particular derivative. And x enters here, here, and here, right? So that means that in these binary choice models, you can say beta is a marginal effect of y or this and that, or whatever. Just that's not how it works. So, however, I wrote here, we can still extract information by simply inspecting beta. Of course, one approach just to compute the marginal effects that I said before, but sometimes people have the betas and so on. And so there are three facts that I think are interesting, so I'm gonna mention them here. Fact number one, the ratio of beta has a meaning in terms of partial effects. Because if you just compute the partial effect of the random variable xj over the partial effect of the random variable xk, 
then that ends up being only beta j over beta k because the other terms that appear before that cancel out. So ratios of betas, okay, give you a sense of the ratio of marginal, uh, marginal effects. So suppose that you compute this ratio and you obtain uh, two. So beta j is actually twice as big as beta k. Well, that means that the marginal effect of xj is twice as big as the marginal effect of xk. So looking at ratios is a, is a really um, easy way to get a sense of at least relative sizes of marginal effects. The other thing is that f prime in both of these models is positive. So the sign of beta j identifies the sign of the marginal effect. If beta j is positive, then you know that the marginal effect is positive, even if you don't know exactly the actual magnitude. And the same way, if beta j is negative, uh, then you know that the beta uh, thing is negative. Similarly, you know, if beta j is zero, you know that the marginal effect is zero. So sometimes people will test, you know, beta equal to zero or whatever in the same way, because that has an impact immediately on the marginal effect. Good. And the fact three is that it's easy to get an upper bound on marginal effects from beta, okay? In the probit case, um, you know, you have that the CDF of the standard normal, okay, at X, okay, is always less than or equal than the CDF, sorry, PDF at zero, which is roughly 0.4. And, you know, remember the, the, the PDF of a normal looks like this. So any value is not greater than the value at zero. Okay, so and then if you do that inequality, the marginal effect is just always going to be bounded by 0.4 times beta j. That's a really quick rule of thumb to know at least how big the effect could be. Of course, this could be a killer if you're just considering a point over here, right? But it gives you a quick sense of how big it could be without having to do math. These are like useful skills when you're at a seminar and people are not reporting the information that you want, but it's not something that you're going to use in other settings. But these are good tricks to know. In the logic case, you know, P times 1 minus P is bounded by 1 fourth, right? That's always the case when P is between 0 and 1. So in that case, it's 1 fourth beta J. Questions about this? Forgot to ask? We're good. All right, these are like three... Um, potentially useful tricks to learn. So now let's think about how do you do this? Marginal effects for xj depend on the entire vector x, as I said before. Okay, so what we can do is to compute an average or mean marginal effect, okay? So you could do this, the expected value, the aggregated marginal effect, the expected value of the marginal effect across the distribution of x, which in this case will give us this over here, the expected value of S f prime times beta j. How will you estimate this? Well, we will replace the expectation for a sample average. So you're replacing this with this, and you need an estimate of beta hat, which appears here and appears here. So one thing that it is important is that uh, you need to understand the difference between this, which is the average partial effect, and the partial effect at the average, which would be doing something like this, f prime at the expected value of x prime beta. And then you will estimate this like this. This data often reports both options. If you just use the options margins when you do binary choice, one thing is um, this first um, thing always has a clear meaning, okay? Because it's an average of effects. Whereas the second one may not make sense. Sometimes it makes sense. If the average person or the person with the average axis is a point of interest, okay? So then you say, okay, I want to evaluate the effect for that average person. But um, it could be that the, you know, you take the average of the x's as not even a person in your sample, okay? Um, and so you, you may want to think about it, okay? What does it mean? You know, imagine that x is gender, okay? Ones and zeros, you take an average, you get the 0.73. So you have to think about what is the effect of evaluating for somebody with that value of x. 
Whereas, as I said, the first one um, always makes sense because you have a partial effect that is different for each individual and you're just aggregating the partial effects uh, over the distribution of X. Um, so one thing that is important also is to not be brain dead and go and apply these formulas like without thinking, in particular when you have variables that are discrete. Okay, this happens often. So let's say D is binary, and now your X is partitioned according to some X's that I'm calling X1. And um, um, so here, there's a typo. There should be X1. I found another typo. Um, so we're gonna, <coughs> so we're gonna partition beta um, accordingly. And so we have the then perspective value of this thing is what we wrote before, but this doesn't make a lot of sense because, you know, D we said is binary. So we're talking about this derivative, you know, though mechanically you can compute it because this formula is exactly the same thing that we did before the formula still apply. The question is whether that captures what you want. So the marginal effect in this case is more like the probability of Y equals one conditional on the other stuff and D equals one minus the probability of Y equals one conditional on the other stuff and D equals zero. And if you just, you know, compute this difference, it's just equals to this difference over here, which as you see, depends on the other covariates, the X ones. And so if you now take an average over S1, you're gonna have this partial effect, which can be estimated like this. And then you can imagine that you could say, oh, I want average effects on the treated or whatever, if the is some sort of like treatment effect and so on. But my point here, more than telling you um, what to do, is to say, think about what you do and, and if what you're doing applies to the variables that you really care about. You know, sometimes, you know, you can say in a defensive way, uh, well, this guy or this guy sometimes is kind of like not too different from this guy. That's fine. That doesn't mean why you wouldn't do this guy, which is the right thing to do, the one that makes sense. Unfortunately, you're gonna see a lot of papers that are gonna use these type of models that report marginal effects for variables that some are discrete, some are continuous, and you don't know what they're doing. And and sometimes you don't know even if you look at their code, okay? Because they did a lot of things and they decided to report one, but it's just you know a good practice to be clear about what you're actually doing. So, Final note, it often makes sense to report marginal effects in a table. Um, so that is, I'm, I'm saying, you know, think about the usual table that people present. They say like here, so like the variable, and so like I have X1, X2, X3, and so on. And then I have my beta, okay? And, and then this is 0.73 and negative 1.23 and so on. It just, um, <coughs> A good idea to report marginal effects as well, as opposed to if if your paper is about again trying to understand these effects. If you're just predicting y given x, of course, you know you don't care about the marginal effects. But um, it's a good practice to do that. Some people put it in, in brackets and parentheses. You know you can decide the format, of course. But if you're dealing with these models, just a, a good idea to report both. Um, then if you're going to do inference, what will require standard errors for those marginal effects. Well, fortunately, that's really standard because in the continuous case, we just work this derivative. This is this function that we wrote before. It's just a function of beta now. Okay. And the function is known. So what you can do is use the delta method. Again, you know, you surely talk about the delta method at, at length with Joel. So you're experts and then you know how that works. Um, straightforward manipulation. So, and that's how standards are computed uh, when you use, for example, the options margins in Stata. And so then you can add to the stable standard errors here and here for beta and for the marginal effects. So in bias statistics, you'll see that the logit model is a lot more popular than the probit. And then in economics, it depends on the field, okay? 
Um, but you know, you can say that both are used. Um, and part of the reason is that the logit model has a clean interpretation of the so-called odd ratios. Okay. And the odd ratios are essentially the ratio of P one over one minus P or P divided by one minus P. And so if P is, if now Y is an outcome that says whether you leave or die. Okay then this ratio is the odds, the relative odds of living over dying, or it could be the other way, yeah. And so that typically has a uh, nice appeal. And then in the probit case, which where the model is like this, and then if you compute P time over one minus P, then this is just the exponent of this. And when you take logs, you have a linear model. So um, in a way, what this means now is that betas, okay, are the marginal effect of xj on the log odds ratio. Okay, so now beta in itself has an interpretation that may be useful um, in some settings. So I wrote here, p over one minus p is the odds ratios of relative risk. Say one, y1 is you live and y0 is you die in a clinical trial. An odds ratio of two means that the odds of survival are twice of those of death. And you're gonna see in biostatistics in particular, they use this a lot. And so the beta now has a clean interpretation because if you say beta j is 0.1, means that the relative probability of survival decreases by 10% uh, roughly, okay? And I wrote here, such easy rounding works for small values of beta j because it's an approximation to this, but that's roughly what's going on, the usual situation with locks, okay? But so then, uh, betas admit a very clean interpretation immediately in terms of this odds ratio. Uh, this interpretation is limited uh, to the logit model, okay? It doesn't apply for the probit one, but that's why you're gonna see that logit sometimes is used um, a lot in some other fields. And as I said, in economics it's used a lot, but you're gonna see the probit as well. Any questions so far? All right, we're getting to the end of today's class. Um, let's talk about the linear probability model. Some people still advocate the use of the linear probability model where you just write X, Y, sorry, X prime beta plus U, you assume conditional mean independence, and then you do least squares and everything that we learned so far, and that's it. Just Y is binary, but mechanically you do exactly the same. The reason, well, there are multiple reasons. One reason is the beta in this case directly delivers marginal effects, right? But more importantly, you can accommodate now things that you may care about, like IVs, panel data with fixed effects, and so on. In addition, you know, with Y binary, two stationary squares or IB is what gives us, for example, a late interpretation, right? So we can estimate these parameters that are, um, that are um, presumably interesting in some settings. So, and these extensions are hard in probit logit, okay? So for endogeneity, for example, there are like bivariate probit models where you have two variables and then you model the response, you model the endogenous variable and the instrument and so on. Those things exist, okay? In the case of fixed effects, there are results for the logit case where you can show that, you know, uh, in some cases, you can allow for fixed effects or not. Um, but in general, allowing these nonlinear models to include all these features, and you know, we have endogeneity, and you have uh, fixed effects, and all this, it's just difficult. And so people, since they put priority in including all these quote-unquote features, uh, they immediately realize, I can use um, a probit or logit, so I'm going to go back to the linear model. So I wrote here, however, it's hard to interpret the linear model causally as the expected value of y given x, because this expectation cannot be linear in most cases. So the model as a model is intrinsically wrong. You have to view it as an approximation of something, right? But that is a tension if you just want to estimate this model as a custom model. We'll go back to our first lecture where we discussed interpretation two versus interpretation three, right? You can view things as, as approximations, and that's fine. That's always well-defined. But when you want to interpret things more causally, you have to believe that you have a model behind this. Okay. Uh, 
So then, you know, then there starts being some gray areas here where people will say like, oh, um, the true model I know that is not linear. I'm going to use an approximation. I'm just going to use least squares. But the true model is a causal model. So I'm going to use my estimators of causal parameters as well as an approximation of the causal parameters. And it starts being things that are uh, just, um, you know, most often described in words and kind of like impossible to formalize mathematically. So um, I wrote here still, you will use the linear model as a descriptive tool to approximate the expected value of y given x. That's always well defined. And we will still have the best linear approximation our predictor to that uh, condition expectation. Okay. But the expected value of y given x is fundamentally nonlinear in this model. Like it or not, you cannot say that it is linear. Okay. So consequence, linear probability model often delivers predicted probabilities outside zero one. As a predicting tool, kind of like um, has this issue, which shows you the internal inconsistency of modeling this as a linear probability model. So if you read mostly, mostly harmonious econometrics, they write, you know, whoops. Um, whoa, why do I hit that? Um, Linear regression may generate fitted values outside the limited dependent variable, that's LDB, that's the Y boundaries, which are zero and one. This fact bothers some researchers and has generated a lot of bad press for the linear probability model. I wrote here, well said. However, later they add, yet we saw that the added complexity and extra work required to interpret the results for the latent index models may not be worth the travel. And I'll argue that statements like this are controversial. Despite that, here it says may not. So it doesn't say that are not. So it could mean that in some cases, you may not want to do this. Uh, what we saw is that the complexity and the extra work in 2021, it's minimal. Perhaps, you know, 30 years ago when estimated maximum likelihood was complicated, and that could be an issue, linear regression was simpler. But today, it takes you a nanosecond to estimate a uh, logic with marginal effects and everything the same way that you get an, uh, a linear model. The issue, I think, that is behind this sentence is, again, when the researcher is more interested about adding these extra features, call it like endogeneity, fixed effects, and all this, okay, and then the actual modeling of the uh, Y1 given X. And so as a result, you're going to see that in fields that are structural, like, again, I'm going to use an example IO, and it could be in some structural labor. Uh, people use, uh, if they're using parametric models, they're going to go for logic probit for sure, okay? Or some variance, and I'm going to discuss next. Um, and if uh, people, if you're more in, in, in um, labor fields sometimes, and you're not dealing with the propensity score, you're dealing with just a model about whether people choose this based on something else, uh, you're going to see a lot of applications with the linear probability model. Even though people know that it's not the right model, even though people know that it gives you probability outside 0, 1, the answer is like, I don't care because I just want to add my fixed effects and my endogenous things and blah, 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 blah. And I want to use these tools. Okay. And that's always a topic of discussion at a seminar. So comments. Logit, probit, and linear probability model yield quite different estimates of beta hat. You just grab the same data, estimate the three models, the beta hats are going to be absolutely different, okay? This is expected, okay? Because if you just use the upper bounds for marginal effects, and this is sort of like rule of thumb calculations, but it gives you a cent, the beta hat um, logit is, has to be about four times of the beta hat OLS. The beta hat probit has to be 2.5 times the beta hat OLS. And the logit is about, you know, 60% larger than the beta hat profit. These are different models. So you just, just go how it is. These relationships are roughly what you uh, will um, often see. However, when you just look at the marginal effects, okay, or the average marginal effects, which is what we discussed from these three models, they're typically close or often, I would say, close. And this partially do because there's a lot of averaging going on, right? Remember that we did like one over n, the sum from one to n of f prime x hat i 
beta hat n, beta hat n. So this is what, what's going on. In least squares, the averaging is, of course, implicit. It comes from the virtue of being a linear model. But um, so this fact over here, or more than a fact, this um, empirical regularity, if you want, is also used as an argument for the linear probability model. What people would say like, well, look, if you care about marginal effects more than prediction, then uh, why not? I mean, I'm just using this, and in the end of the day, I'm getting marginal effects that are roughly the same. And um, that's an argument. Last slide, you know, we don't have time in this class to discuss this, but any of you who is interested in I.O., takes I.O. classes, you're going to learn that there are a lot of extensions on these basic ideas. Essentially, similar ideas, but you go, for example, to order choice, okay, where individuals decide how many units to buy from the same item. You go to the store, do you buy one, two, three, four, five, and then that's that's the problem that you try to model. So it's not binary anymore, it's discrete, um, and it's called order choice because you know that buying three is more than buying two. An order choice is where individuals decide to buy one of many different alternatives. You just go and buy beer, okay, and then you choose a particular brand, okay, and there are many choices, but there are no order. It's just, you know, just the order is arbitrary. That's an order choice. And then when you care about this type of problems, you know, you start having things called conditional logit, multinomial logit, and these are like extensions of the things that we said before. In particular, the logit model in general adapts a lot better to these generalizations that the probit uh, model, just by virtue of the functional forms, okay? Um, if you think about what's the most popular example in I.O. is demand estimation BLP, which doesn't fall into any of this, but is like uh, a derivation of these tools where you estimate demand. And then, you know, the first application in Barry Levinson Pecos was, you know, choosing cars, okay? You just want to buy a new car, there are a lot of brands, okay, and you care about the features of these cars, of course, price being one of them, but you care if they have AC or not. That's funny, but that was one of the characteristics in that paper at the time. And, you know, whether, you know, they have a third row or a seat in or not, and they have a nice uh, aesthetics and safety features and blah, blah, blah. And that's a case in which you just choose one out of the many brands, okay? And that model is used in I.O. all the time. These topics are not going to be covered in econometrics courses in second year. It's just the I.O. classes um, give a comprehensive treatment uh, uh, on all these topics. And that's it for today. Um, that's um, my uh, introduction to binary choice. Um, and if um, I hope you found it clear. So are there questions? Yeah.